This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, and I'd like to give a big shout out to all the partially deaf people out there. My co-host is John Paston, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of Allset Learning, the Chinese grammar wiki, Sinosplice.com, and told me that now is not the right time to surround yourself with positive people. Translation, we're going to talk about it, about its place in learning Chinese, and along with when it's helpful in the learning process and when it's not. Guest interview is with Jeremy Goldcorn, a 20-year veteran of China from South Africa, editor-in-chief of Sup China, and co-host of the Seneca podcast. We had a fascinating discussion ranging from how, in South Africa, the Chinese people fit into the apartheid system to the importance of the Chinese language in the future. All this and more, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. And I'm John Pazin in Shanghai, China. Hey guys. All right, Johnny, before we kick into the show, we have a few reviews. All right. Our first one comes from Elena Delcheva. I'm writing all of this because I firmly believe that one should tell people when they've made a positive contribution to one's life, and you have. I do hope you are working on more text so you can have at least books at every level. I shall be looking out for them, and I shall make sure that I read all of them. I wish you good luck and success in your endeavors. Regards, Elena Delcheva Scott. Elena, thank you so much. Okay, so this one is from Michael Harks, and he says... I just wanted to thank you guys for providing these graded readers. I never knew that graded readers existed until I began learning Chinese. They should honestly use graded readers in every school for learning foreign languages. It's a lot more efficient than learning lists of words without any context, let alone the grammar you subconsciously pick up while reading. I've been learning Chinese for almost a year now, and I just finished HSK 3. I must say that the level one readers are perfect for this level. Reading a Chinese book and understanding it is way more satisfying than just passing a test which says you mastered X amount of characters. Anyways, my favorite book is The Monkey's Paw, and I hope that there will be more horror-themed books in the near future. Kind regards from the Netherlands. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Okay, our next review comes from Caitlin Walter. Now, Caitlin had some comments and a question, so we'll, we'll start with her comments. She says, thanks for the italki and hello talk recommendations. I'll look into those to kickstart my Spanish learning. Much, as she writes, I am a learner very much in the intermediate plateau phase. I've tried several times to just read Chinese, but looking up words took too long. At one point, I tried to read a lot with a browser extension, but even though it saved time, there were too many new words for it to be effective. Then nine months ago, I stumbled into Manor Companion and was such a game changer. When I came back from studying in China five years ago, I had all kinds of ambitious plans to keep learning Chinese, but they were unsustainable. I only wish I had your books five years ago, but I'm glad to have found them now. As for the podcast and books, you've got a loyal customer in me. Now, Caitlin goes on to ask, she says, how effective is Rosetta Stone in introducing and building comprehensible input? Does it have a role in any stage of the language learning journey? Thanks, Caitlin from Arizona. Well, Caitlin, thanks for the question. Well, John, what's your opinion on Rosetta Stone? Rosetta Stone is a little tricky because it's evolved quite a bit over the years. It started out as like the CD-ROM thing that took advantage of the new technology of the CD-ROM drive for the home computer, right? And it's been a while. And although the method at its core kind of comes down to just a whole bunch of sentences translated into other languages that you practice to build vocabulary, it does have online components. I know it's also possible to practice with a native speaker teacher online, I think. But I can't comment too authoritatively on it because I haven't seen the newest iterations of the product but I think it's okay to get your feet wet, but it's probably not the best method for the long term. And if you have to pay a lot for it, I would keep looking. Back in Shanghai, one of my friends had one of his friends who came out and visited Shanghai for a month. And every morning he spent an hour on Rosetta Stone. And, you know, after a few weeks, he was just out there trying to speak all the time. He was able to start saying some things. But, you know, in my experience, and once again, John, you have a good perspective there that it has evolved quite a bit. There are previous methods, and I... I'm not sure how much they're employed right now, but it was just really like repeating a lot, parroting a lot of things. John, one thing I have seen about people who develop curriculums, taking a radical mm. detour away from what they've been doing is sometimes really hard for the people that have you know invested all the time in developing it. And so 
like I said, I haven't been really in depth with uh, Rosetta Stone recently, but we are aware of other platforms out there which are based on modern research that we do recommend. And I also find that just any method that kind of starts with one core set of language and just translate it into other languages is going to fall short a little bit because every language is special. Every language needs its own attention. So overall, my suggestion is that if you really want to get into Chinese and really learn it, like seriously, I would start with some of these other platforms that we've talked about on this podcast. Rosetta Stone might be a great thing. Hey, if I want to go study Chinese for a month or two before I go out there on a trip. Yeah, and if you're going to use Rosetta Stone for that purpose, you could also consider Duolingo, right, which is free. All right, so today our topic is the role of translation in language learning. Translation is not something you can get away from entirely when you're learning a language. And hey, maybe even like translation, but it's going to play some kind of role. So the question is, what is a good role for translation in your studies and how do you do it? Let me ask you, Jared, like, what kind of role has translation played in your studies? And do you think it was positive or negative? Well, I think as an adult learner, we all translate, right? Because we have our frame of reference, which is our native tongue. So I think for me, you know, I did translate a lot of things at the beginning, obviously, to try to understand what, what I was saying in Chinese. But of course, you know, I, I think I did the newbie thing that all of us do is that we're trying to listen in Chinese and we're translating it back into our native language in our head to try to comprehend it. And that's why, you know, I was slow at the beginning. So you're talking about mental translation. Yeah, mental translation. But I got to be honest, I did not spend much time just translating sentences as exercises to learn. Because you don't like it or because uh, you just didn't think that was a good use of your time? You know what, John? Honestly, it never really crossed my mind to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I gotta be honest. Like, I was out learning on the streets of Shanghai and with colleagues. I was constantly using Chinese to communicate. And so I didn't really spend any of my time just like writing out translations or working on translating stuff. All right, here's where I'm gonna share a secret with our audience. Um, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this personal information, Jared. But everybody, Jared is a talker. This guy likes to talk. And uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that played a, sure? a role here. Before we get into the other stuff, one other thing I want to cover is Mandarin Companion books. Go buy them. So our books are in easy-to-read Chinese. Go buy They're them. to get you reading, the improving your fluency now, reading material at your level. Subliminal message. But why don't we include English translations? Why not? Well, you know, the reason that we don't have that translation in our books is because it's forcing you to understand it in Chinese, which is something that's very important. Yeah. So if you have the English, just like if the pinyin is there, you know, Jared likes to call it the crippling crutch and your eyes will go to the pinyin. If you have the English, you're not going to try as hard to understand it. You're just going to check the English and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I get that. But actually, you didn't totally get that. You just kind of had an inkling and you needed the English to confirm your understanding. But if you're reading it entirely in Chinese and your level is high enough that you actually can, then that's when the real learning and the real development is going to happen. Yeah, it's kind of like going out for a swim without a life vest, you know, but the water, it's not very deep. So that, that's what I like about the books is they're not very deep linguistically wise. And you can swim through these books without drowning. In my experience with, for example, my kids and also working with different learners and in different schools and teachers is that if you have that English in there, they will spend time reading through the English. Even if they understand it in Chinese, they're going to go back and read the English We're like just to make sure. But there's something about that, not having that lifeline, not having that life vest, if you will, that really gets you to really swim. Yeah. And notice that not having the English does have implications on the level. So if your level is just high enough to read it, if there's an English translation, but there isn't an English translation, that means you're probably going to want your level to be a little bit higher. You're going to want to be a little bit more comfortable reading Chinese before you try to do the entire book. And that's not a bad thing. It's just something you need to be aware of. You know, John, I think a good example, too, is my son. Back when we lived in China, I got him Diary of a Wimpy Kid in Chinese. But it also had the English translation. Frankly, what ended up happening with him is he just read the English <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he could read the Chinese okay, but the English was faster. And so he ended up just focusing on the English. It's so tempting. It's not quite as bad as peeing over the top of the characters, but absolutely it's tempting. And I will also say that there is value in the struggle sometimes. When you 
yes. come across a sentence and you know all those characters and maybe you even know the words and you're kind of like, what does this mean? I, I couldn't quite understand it. I, John, I've done this with you before. Right? Sometimes on drafts of books, I'm like, hey, you put this sentence here and that doesn't make sense because John's Chinese is way better than mine. And then he's like, dude, read it again. And I go back and I read it. I'm like, oh, oh, I, t- I, t- idiot. <laughs> I see it now. Right. <laughs> This issue of like having the translation right there, it's not only an issue of like, you know, trying to read Manor Companion books. I see this issue a lot with my clients. And what they do is they have like a work email and their Chinese is good. But rather than trying to get through it, like maybe just looking up a few words here and there, they put the whole thing into Google Translate. And then the Google Translation isn't perfect, but they can understand it, right? And then they're kind of mm-hmm. looking back and forth like, oh, yeah, that's this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can read it. And so they get the sense that they can read it with the help of Google Translate, but they're not actually learning anything. If they had put forth a little bit of effort and time and actually struggled to read it, then they might actually remember some of those words and some of those structures for the next time they get a similar email. But by putting it into Google Translate, it's not going to stick. And I think, John, this it underscores the importance of having texts that are appropriate and at your level. And I, I get it because I've got those emails too where it's in Chinese, it's not written for me clearly, right? And I might be reading that 60, 70% comprehension on that. And yeah, sometimes I do do the Google Translate because I just got to get through it. But other times maybe where it's something that's more at my level in reading, yeah, definitely, you know, I can get through this, I can understand it, and it's a rewarding experience. So you have to be clear if you're using Google Translate, am I actually trying to learn this or am I just trying to find out what it says? Because if you're actually trying to learn it, then you do not want to be using Google Translate and that kind of tool that takes all the effort and all the thinking away. Now I want to to change gears a little bit and talk more about translation and how it applies to learning in general. Because translation is something with a lot of baggage in foreign language education. I don't know, maybe you're not aware, Jared, because uh, you just go out and talk to people. But some people spend (laughs) a lot of time on translation as part of their studies, and some people have a lot of strong opinions about it. And part of the reason for that is like in the past, 19th century and before, a lot of foreign language study was focused on the classics, Greek, Latin, and there was a lot of translation. And there wasn't a whole lot of like practice speaking because these were dead languages and people wanted to be able to access the original classics. And so they needed to be able to read Greek and Latin. So translation made sense. But that was for classics, right? And then later on, the same method, we call this the grammar translation method because it's focused on vocabulary and grammar and then just translation. The same approach was applied to modern practical languages, and it was just a lot of dealing with text and translating. So that approach was later kind of discarded in favor of the communicative approach, which means actually talking. Sounds like one that you're enjoying a bit more, right, Jared? John, just to back you up on this, is I, I've worked with different teachers, and uh, this is not uncommon that they will just have you know translation exercises on tests. And I know that there's like other textbooks that have these exercises in them. I've seen learners, you know, on different forums and stuff talking about, hey, that they, they would work through these translation sentences and exercises and things like that. So this is a pretty commonly used method that some people will use to learn Chinese or heck, any language, really. All right. And so the question that is sometimes raised is, is translation a bad method? Like, am I wasting my time doing translation when, you know, I could just let Google Translate translate stuff and I can just uh, talk, right? And the answer that I like to give is that no, translation is not bad. It does have its place. It can be useful to think about, how do I say that in Chinese? Especially when it's a sentence that you might actually want to use. Like this is something that you will say in the near future, then learning how to translate it is worth your time. But if all you're doing is translating English to Chinese, Chinese to English, and you're not practicing speaking or listening, then that's going to be a problem if you actually want to communicate with anybody. Yeah, totally. You know, and John, actually, now that you mention it like this, that I, I did use translation sometimes. For example, I remember when I finally learned how do I say this character in Chinese. <laughs> And I actually had to ask a, a friend, I'm like, hey, how do I say, how do I pronounce this character in Chinese? And when they told me, I'm like, ah, and I use that all the time. And for anyone listening, this is, uh, I, I learned it as, 
Yeah, so especially when it's for, you know, direct application, translation is not bad. But I find that translation can be really, really good. Like I use this with my, my clients uh, at All Set Learning. When, for example, someone's already got the vocabulary, they have the basic grammar structures, but you throw together like a particular combination of words, words that they know, and they're just kind of like, ah, how do I say that? Like, that's not something I've ever really articulated, and I feel like I should be able to say it. Like, it's not hard, but it takes them a while to wrap their head around it. So by practicing this, this kind of sentence, which is not stretching your vocabulary or your grammar necessarily, you're kind of exercising you know, putting things into the Chinese way of phrasing. And because you're doing it on your own when you have plenty of time, that means next time when you're faced with some kind of communication challenge and you need to think on the spot, you're going to be faster. Yeah, you know, John, I, I really agree with that. And I think a lot of the exercises that I've seen within different classes and teachers and sometimes textbooks is that they give you those like arbitrary sentences and usually they're not going to be useful to you or they have very limited applicability to what you might be doing or trying to learn or trying to accomplish with your Chinese. There are a few other issues related to translation, though, that I also wanted to touch on. One is just like uh, looking up words. So I've noticed that one problem that learners have is the want a word, they'll look it up in the dictionary, you know, like there's 10 translations for this word. Wow, let me see all the different ones because I need to master all these to get good at Chinese. But in reality, like nine of them are not very commonly used at all. And only the one mm -hmm. they want is actually useful. So mm -hmm. like one good tip for beginners and elementary learners, even intermediate learners, is to really focus on the need that you have and to kind of try to block out all those other words which are distracting you because they're probably not that important. This is why learner dictionaries are super useful. They try to give you only the ones that you'll probably need as a beginner. Even though Pleco is a great dictionary, it doesn't do a great job like filtering out the uncommon or obscure vocabulary that show up when you look up a common word. But sometimes there are multiple words that you need. So, for example, what if you look up the word can, right? You look oh, up yeah, can, wow. you see you see kui, you see nung, uh, you see hui, you see a can of beans, that can, you see all these different words. So you can look at the examples and you can figure out the one that you want. And I definitely recommend the, the just-in-time method of just figure out which one you need now, write that one down, use it. Don't take this as the time to learn the difference between all these words, because if you're not ready to learn the difference and you haven't learned those other words, it's just too much. So focus on the word that you need right now. And then later on, once you have learned those other words, and you know that there are three main ways to say can, like, you know, hui, kui, and neng, by the way, Chinese Grammar Wiki, good place to learn that. Once you've learned those, you know all the words individually, and then you know them you know, as they contrast with each other, then translation can be real useful because you have a sentence that uses can, and then you're like, all right, can, which can is this? And as long as it's a sentence, which you might actually say, you know, it's somewhat practical, then practicing figuring out which can that you need without lots of time pressure, because, you know, there's not a native speaker staring at you and waiting for your reply, you can get lots of good practice that way. You know, and ultimately, John, I think, you know, I want to bring it back to what is the most common mode of translation, I think, for learners, and that's like translating in your head to just try to understand what is, uh, you know, going on in, in the conversation. And it's a hard habit to break. This is also one of the reasons that we really advocate in graded readers and reading speed. You know, we talk a lot about reading speed on this is because that is an excellent way to break this habit. There's a lot of times, you know, learners, you're listening in Chinese or even you're reading in Chinese and you're just translating into your head. And this is one very common reason why you're slow to respond. And so you want to break this habit and you want to move towards just understanding in Chinese. And as we say, getting enough input of the language is really ultimately what you need because your brain needs to start to automatically process this language so you don't need to translate in your head anymore. And if you have a graded text that is at your level that you can read fluently, Maybe you're reading slow at the beginning and you're not reading fast, but you start reading as you build your reading speed. What kind of happens is, is that you stop having time to translate in your head and it kind of forces your brain to start thinking and understanding and comprehending it in Chinese. And once that starts to happen, it's really amazing. It does amazing things for your fluency. And that's why extensive reading, you know, reading at your level 
in Chinese also has benefits with your speaking, your listening, and your writing because your brain just starts to comprehend it in Chinese. Yeah, and honestly, you don't even have to consciously try to break the habit. As long as you get enough input and you keep doing that practice, you're going to automatically make the transition. It's just like, you know, if you're learning to play piano, you might start out by hunting for the proper keys. But, you know, once you practice enough, you're not hunting anymore. Your, your fingers are going in the right place. It's totally true. And, you know, there's thousands, tens of the hundreds of thousands of people out there who've learned Chinese without extensive reading. And it's just, as you said, John, it's right. They just got enough comprehensible input. The great thing about extensive reading is that it's frankly a shortcut to that. It's a great way to get mass amounts of comprehensible input, and it's going to shortcut that time it's going to take you to get to fluency till you, you start to automatically process the language so you don't have to translate anymore. Yeah, and if you keep pushing into harder and harder material without ever getting to that point of automatically understanding, you're just making it unnecessarily hard on yourself. So it might kind of feel like you're spending all this time without making progress, but being able to automatically understand is huge progress. So don't underestimate that. Absolutely. That's why we say, if you only know 300 words, be fluent in those 300 words. It'll be an amazing base that you build off of and where you really can grow your language skills to something much better than you could have comprehended. Okay. So I just want to leave with three little points to kind of sum up what we said today. So the first point is you don't need a translation to comprehend a text. If it's too hard for you without a translation, it might just be too hard. But if you can kind of do it, then that struggle is meaningful. All right. So you do not need a translation to understand a text if it's at the right level. Number two, when you're looking up words, try to just find the one meaning that you need and don't get distracted by all those other meanings. Take what you need now and resist the urge to like understand all those other meetings because it's probably going to cause trouble. And number three, uh, translation can be useful, forcing you to think in Chinese, whether it's in grammar or using the right vocabulary, but it's definitely useful if you know the words already and you're just practicing choosing the right ones or putting them in the right order. And that kind of practice is actually quite helpful. And if you don't do it on your own, you're going to be doing it face-to-face, -face, and it's a little bit excruciating. <laughs> Words from a man who knows. John passed it. All right, now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And our sponsor is the Chinese Grammar Wiki. The Chinese Grammar Wiki is a site by All Set Learning. It is free online. If you just search for Chinese grammar, you should find it. Or you can go to allsetlearning.com. On this show, we don't often recommend, like, you know, go out and learn your grammar. But sometimes there's a grammar point where you really want to get clear on something. Maybe it's the difference between the different kinds of can, or maybe it's, you know, just some grammar point you don't totally understand. And if you need a reference, this is the reference for you. I love grammar. Yeah, Jared's used it too. He doesn't like to admit it. I also love slitting my wrist and doing push-ups and lemon juice. No, just kidding. You know, the, the Chinese grammar, okay, it is fantastic. And, you know, hey, John, I, I run across teachers and they do know about this resource. And I'm like, hey, you know, that's, that's John Passon's thing. They're like, Wow. People actually do that. Well, yep, it's John. So it's an amazing resource out there for grammar, for all you who love to study grammar. And John, you are kind of a strange guy. You, you kind of like studying grammar. For some people, they just kind of like enjoy the puzzle of it. And I think I'm one of those people. I'm glad there are people like you, John. All right, now it's time for rants and raves. John, what do you have for us today? Do you have a rant or do you have a rave? I have kind of a weird rave. It's related to today's topic. So my rave is for Pimsler. And Pimsler is thought of as kind of a, an outmoded, you know, method. You listen to something, you repeat it. It's like listening and repeating. And that's that's not progressive. That's not like a new way of learning. But the cool thing about Pimsler is that he kind of did the whole spaced repetition system thing before it made its way into flashcards, before people understood that reading is the real spaced repetition. And so I think it's just a really cool course. It's a little bit outdated now, maybe, but um, it's something that I think deserves uh, some credit. That you know, sounds good. You know, that matches with uh, something I always say is that there's a lot of ways to learn a language. Some are more effective than others, but that, that's definitely one way you can do it, right? I am ready. All right. Well, I am ranting about the recent, at least in the United States here, the Trump administration they suspended entry of foreign nationals under J visas and other visas until the end of the year, just 2020 here. 
And well, I'm not necessarily a big fan of all that anyway. It's created a huge problem for immersion in Chinese programs all across the United States. Because essentially what this this is going to do is this is going to bar entry of all sorts of teachers who come over here to teach Chinese in schools all over the United States. And especially here in Utah, where I'm at, uh, it's kind of like the dual immersion capital of the United States. And we have over 80 dual immersion schools here. And they hire, there's like 200 Chinese teachers. Most of them come from China. And so it's going to be a huge problem for schools and many education institutions just around the United States. But there is a small glimmer of hope on that. The senators and representatives here for Utah with pressure from some Utah citizens and everything, they petitioned the White House for an exemption on that for teachers in dual immersion programs. And that was just issued on July 22nd. So if anyone here listening is dealing with this issue that they are aware of, their state has a lot of immersion programs like this, I encourage you, you know, contact your elected representatives. Utah got an exemption. I think it's very possible that maybe your state, if it needs it, might be able to get that. And if you're not in the U.S., well, good for you. Jared, are your kids going to be directly impacted by this maybe? It's quite possible. I do know that the immersion schools here in our town, I think they have two or three spots for teachers. I don't know if they're going to be able to fill them in time. You know, funny enough, John, that they are so desperate for some teachers. My wife threw her hat in the ring as a possible candidate for teacher in one of the dual immersion programs. And her Chinese is not as good as mine, but I mean, it's she can definitely help kids. And they interviewed her. <laughs> All right. Well, it's time for an interview, right? My name is Jeremy Goldcorn. I am originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. Today, I am the editor-in-chief of SubChina.com. If you haven't heard of SubChina, it exists to provide audiences around the world with an accurate, comprehensive, and contextual understanding of China. If you're interested in China, check it out. So I moved to Mm. China in uh, 1995 and lived there until 2015 for 20 years. But most of my time was spent as a editor and publisher of various magazines and websites. While Jeremy didn't mention it, he is also the co-host of the weekly Seneca podcast. It's all about current affairs in China. You also might want to check that out. Jeremy has such an insightful view of the language and the country and underscored to me how learning Chinese involves so much more than learning characters and speaking words. Stay with us. So Jeremy, why did you first have this fascination with China that you decide, hey, I wanted to go even live in China? You know, South Africa was very cut off in the 80s when I I was growing up from the rest of the world. Most uh, developing countries did not let us in, including China, most African countries, most Asian countries. We were still allowed into much of Western Europe and, and the United States. But I kind of had a bit of a, I think what the if I may be allowed some pretensions, the French poet Rambo called the horror of home. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, apartheid South Africa in the eighties. I, I, I never felt that I wanted to stay there. And mm. although apartheid ended basically just as I entered college, Nelson Mandela was let out of prison the day before I started university. I'd had this desire from a very young age to go and live somewhere else, and. I kind of wanted to get as far away from home as possible, and China just seemed to fit the bill. It was so foreign that if I wanted to get away from home, that was the place to go because I would be illiterate. And as it turned out, when I arrived there, I couldn't use chopsticks. I was illiterate. You know, it felt like being a baby. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> couldn't read, couldn't speak, couldn't talk, couldn't eat. You know, <laughs> what was it though? What was there something like you encountered, like a TV show, a book, anyone you met, or something where all of a sudden was like, "Hey, China, that's cool. That's where I want to go." I mean, I I thought about this question a lot because I have been asked it quite a lot, and. Recently, after moving to the United States in 2015, I I now live in Nashville, I never accumulated a lot of possessions, but there's some things that I've carried around with me around the world. And one of them was this little Buddha carved out of bone that I had been given as a souvenir uh, on a family holiday to the island of Mauritius when I was uh, five years old, which was my first time as a kid to go out of South Africa. And I had always carried that thing around and it had always seemed this contrast from like South Africa had a very sort of Calvinistic like religion 
in the apartheid era where everything was very serious. It was, you know, all about sin and racism and stuff like that. And the, mm-hmm. the, the, the Chinese Buddha, because this was from the Chinese community in Mauritius, which has been there for a long, long time. The Buddha was fat and smiling and had big ears like I did. Now you've like forced me to reveal a childhood memory. I don't think I've ever told anyone except my wife. But if I had to trace it back to like an origin, that would be it. Wow. Wow. So you actually did have some interaction with some Chinese people on that vacation when you were five years old. It was strange because South Africa, I mean, we didn't have any, there was no Chinese classes, even at universities. I don't think there was any Chinese instruction at all. There was a small Chinese community in Johannesburg who, during apartheid, occupied this very uncomfortable position of not being completely classified in the very complex racial Mm. classification system of apartheid. So how did they fit in? Well, they were sort of not quite white, but not quite anything else. So they fit in, you know, as I guess a lot of Chinese communities used to do you know, in much of the 20th century was by sort of being fairly quiet and keeping to themselves. There was a Chinese school, but uh, yeah, a very small community. Mm. And later, after the end of apartheid, they are now recognized, the Chinese who were there before the end of apartheid, they are recognized as, you know, previously discriminated against group. Wow, that's really interesting. And it sounds like there were kind of some quasi- gray area. Yeah, I don't think it was ever very clearly defined. Some other ethnic groups, for example, South Africa, I don't know if uh, it's probably not the case anymore, but South Africa used to have the highest number of people of Indian origin living outside of India, most of whom I think originally their ancestors were brought over as indentured laborers by the British colonists. And they had a specific categorization in apartheid law as, you know, a race and that were granted certain rights and, you know, denied <laughs> most others. But I think the Chinese community was too small and never presented a big enough problem for the apartheid state to like actually write very clear laws about them. Wow. So then what kind of happened next? You decided, I want to go to China. I mean, how did you chart your path there? I mean, this is in the 90s. So I went to London and, you know, lived there working odd jobs. And look, uh, I did a, one of those TOEFL, whatever, teaching English courses, and then look for jobs. And I answered a job in the newspaper. I think it was one of the education newspapers in the UK, actual print newspaper that I wrote a letter to. uh, (laughs) Wow. Like anyone does that anymore. (laughs) And I got a letter in response. And then I had to take a train from London all the way up to some tiny place in the northeast of England, where the guy who was managing this pro-English teaching program was from, and he was on a holiday. So I I had this interview and ended up working at a joint venture factory in Beijing run by a Swiss-Swedish engineering company. um, Oh, really? Called ABB. They're, you know, it's a very big company. And they were, you know, early on in China building power infrastructure, essentially. They build you know, pretty much anything related to electrical energy from little drives and switches to nuclear power stations. So they had a number of joint ventures around all around China. At the mm-hmm. time, it was almost impossible to get a wholly owned foreign venture. And in fact, I think in many of these industries, it still is. So they had mm-hmm. these joint ventures. And generally, it would be with the local state-owned factory. So like in the case of the one that I joined was a, a factory that made a, a certain type of electrical drive and switch. And uh, so there was this joint venture where ABB, the um, foreign partner, they had to take uh, a certain number of employees from the state-owned factory because, you know, obviously the state-owned factory was then mm-hmm. going to probably go out of business. And, you know, they were trying to not make the introduction of the market economy too hard on on these people. So, that meant that you had this bunch of, you know, the senior managers at the state-owned factory who then became managers at the joint venture were older people, generally men, and they had no foreign language learning. I mean, their education, they were lucky that they got educated. Most of their lives were interrupted by the Cultural Revolution in some way. Mm-hmm. And language learning certainly wasn't a priority. And if they'd learned any foreign language, it was probably Russian, which they'd already forgotten. And it was a kind of a hopeless endeavor because take some people in their 50s and 60s who've never really learned a foreign language and are already a little overwhelmed by this new sudden work environment and, you know, give them 
20 minutes a day with some foreigner with no experience teaching English. And you know what the results is going to be. I learned Chinese and they learned no English. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think something just thrown in here for a point of cultural reference for listeners, but that 90s was a, a period of heavy industrialization and development within China. I think it became a little bit more of the world's factory during that time. Oh, absolutely. The factory where I worked was built between what is now Beijing's fourth and fifth ring road. Oh, really? So it's very built up. It's urban. It's yeah. actually not even considered that far from the city center right now. But back then, around this development zone that our factory was in was rural land. You know, there were still people farming. You know, that was the other thing. They housed me in the workers' dormitory in the development zone. At the time in Beijing, the rules were still quite strict. Other cities that loosened up, but Beijing was still fairly strict about keeping foreigners in only it was called show wai gong yu, you know, like mm -hmm. foreign affairs, you know, dealing with foreigners' apartments. And you were supposed to stay in one of these if you're a foreigner, but they were all, you know, very, very expensive. And I was a poorly paid English teacher. And one of these apartments would have been many, many times what my salary was. So they ended up putting me in the, in the workers dormitory, which was physically not very comfortable, you know, sharing a room and yeah. <laughs> with a bunch of workers and then, you know, squat toilets with no walls between them and no hot water because the management was too cheap to give hot water for shower, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I mean, but it was very good for my Chinese because after work where I didn't speak that much English anyway, I'd come home and I'd have to speak to my dorm mates. But I do hold them partly responsible for my awful tones because many of them were from <laughs> like rural Anhui and Hunan. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I do want to hear now, Jeremy. Is like, how did you get into actually like breaking the ice of like starting to learn Chinese? When I first went to China, I, I honestly didn't think it would end up being such a big part of my life. I thought I'd go there for a year or two and then, you know, go home and do something else. So I hadn't really gone there with the intention that I was going to become fluent in Chinese. But as soon as I got there, I realized that if I wanted to have fun, I had to speak Chinese. So I bought as many books as I could, and I just started trying to speak Chinese as much as possible and talking to my doormates and riding my bicycle around Beijing and just trying to engage anyone in conversation. And at that time, mid-90s in Beijing, 1995, Beijing was sort of opening up again after 1989. People were relaxing. People were curious about foreigners. So it was very easy to talk to people. So that's really what I did. I just talked to a lot of people. Just learn it on the streets. Pretty much. Yeah. And, you know, with a book to learn kind of the basic rules. And at first I thought I didn't want to learn to write. And then I realized that you can't talk if you don't understand how the writing works. So there's a lot of people have gone to China. They've lived there for a long time and they might even be around a lot of Chinese speakers, but they don't really ever pick up the language. So I'm going to find out a little bit like what was a little different for you versus maybe that person who had also been exposed to a lot of Chinese, but didn't really learn it. I think effort is the main difference. I mean, some people are very lucky and they're just very talented with languages. I'm not one of those people. I put the effort into it. I did go home at night and look at the books and rehearse the tones and do the boring stuff. I, I still cannot write at all really with a pen, but I can write with a computer. But I spent plenty of time just trying to write characters. And I think with Chinese particularly, effort is rewarded more than anything else. You, you simply have to put in the effort. I think that's the biggest difference. If you are curious enough and determined enough to put in the effort, it'll come. But, you know, it's the sort of 10,000 hours thing. I don't think it takes 10,000 hours to get a basic grasp of Chinese, but it takes a lot of hours. How long do you think it took you before you were feeling more competent and just maybe functioning in everyday life in China versus maybe to a level where you're like, hey, now I can translate documents. After I'd been in China about six months, my parents visited me and we took a bike ride from Kunming all the way to Yangshuo to, to Guangxi, Guilin, through Guizhou. 
And it was still, you know, pretty rough China, like everything undeveloped and nobody spoke English anywhere, like pretty much along the road. And like I sufficiently impressed my parents that they thought I was a genius. You know, I, I was probably like, Ni hao, wo yao yi par, gong bao ji ding. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure it's awful. <laughs> but I, I felt as though I could like communicate and like I could negotiate with a hotel about a room rate and I could basically function after about six months. But I mean, I, I did have a very intense experience of living in that dorm. The general manager and the production manager of the factory where I worked were the only foreigners that I had any interaction with. I simply didn't know any other foreigners. And they were Finnish, you know, much older than me and didn't really have anything to say to me. So I, I, I literally, you know, for six months, I didn't really speak English. There was no, oh, wow. I, I had no internet. So I was still writing letters by mail with a pen mm -hmm. so i mean i was pretty isolated it was kind of immersion so i had six months of immersion i guess so i yeah. think that's enough to get you like I, I would say crude but fluent very crude but fluent well uh, i think that's fascinating it sounds to me that you had immersion with you putting in a lot of effort and then that generated some real results for you yeah when I, younger people ask me advice about going to learn Chinese, I'm like, don't go to Beijing or Shanghai, some university. Go to Bengbu, Yuyan, Daxia, or whatever. You know, like find some place where there's no foreigners. Same in Taiwan, but like, don't go to Taipei. You know, go somewhere where you you're forced to just deal with Chinese linguistic reality on a day to day basis. So what happened where you went from teaching English in these factories to, and I know you started this website, Dan Wei, where you were translating like Chinese news and giving commentary on news. So I, I want to hear a little bit about this. Like what, what happened? I had always wanted to sort of see parts of like the Silk Road. So while I, while I was teaching English and then I got this sort of training manager job, I did that for about almost two years and I said I was saving money. And I planned this trip. So I flew from Beijing to Pakistan. And then I rode a bicycle from Islamabad to Peshawar and then like sort of into the Afghan, the Khyber Pass area around and then back up the Karakoram Highway into China and around Xinjiang wow. and Qinghai and Tibet and then ended up in Nepal. And that was sort of wow. going to be my swan song from Beijing. And I'd originally intended to uh, cycle all the way back to Beijing, but like after like winter in Tibet, I was just like, I'm going to Nepal. I'm going to go and just chill out in Kathmandu for a while. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. so, like I, I don't want to go. Anyway, so then I, I ran out of money. So I had to fly back from Kathmandu <laughs> to Beijing. And I thought, okay, I've you know just got enough to get out of here. I'm going to pack up my meager belongings and maybe go back to South Africa. And I, uh, a friend of a friend offered me a job as a managing editor of this entertainment magazine called Beijing Scene, which was sort of aimed at foreigners in Beijing. And I ended up doing that for a couple of years. And then I got hooked on media in China and sort of entrepreneurial things. The last thing I did was called Dunway. And it was, it's sadly defunct now. We covered media and advertising and urban life. That was our tagline in China. Uh, a lot of translation from Chinese media and internet blogs and stuff at the time they were taking off. And yeah, that ended up sort of becoming a company that I sold and ended up moving to America after that. So Jeremy, you've been working in like Chinese media, and this is obviously a very sensitive area <laughs> in China, right? Yeah. So I, what was your experience doing this in China? What kind of challenges did you have? Well, there's absolutely no way you could do now what I was doing. But in the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s, China, you know, generally in Beijing, it was very open to foreign entrepreneurs. And a lot of the rules weren't very clearly defined. So it was very easy to just launch something. And if you did something wrong, you could say sorry. But like, if you are ever asked for permission, you know, they'd say no. But if you just did something, sometimes it would work, it would make money and it'd be okay. And you could do it it was sort of almost like a wild west atmosphere. So <laughs> it's something you just couldn't do now. But back then, it seemed like the possibilities were endless. So, you know, you could just say, damn, and I'm going to start a website about Chinese media and publish some things that are fairly critical of the government. And it was okay. And, you know, even 
as I was publishing things of the critical of the Chinese government, I, you know, I'd get interviewed by Chinese media and it was a little bit live and let live. It was a very fun atmosphere that also allowed you to try all kinds of kind of media things. But sadly, that's not the case anymore. Everything is a lot more tightly controlled. I mean, you can do stuff that is not political at all. But if you start to involve with politics, you can get into trouble pretty quickly now. Wow, I, I believe that. How does Sub China today, like how does that fit into all this? I ended up joining Sub China because one of the things I've done aside from Dunway was initially a hobby was the Seneca podcast uh, with Kaiser Guo. And we kind of got acquired by Sub China in Sub China's early days in 2016. And then I ended up becoming the editor in chief of the whole website. We're a New York based company and almost all of our operations are in the United States. We have a lot of contributors in China. But, you know, we're not really affected by the environment in China because we are a U.S.-based company. Do you think Chinese is going to be important in the future? Is it an important language for people to learn today? I think it's very important and it's only growing in, in importance despite the wide availability of translation software and AI. It's very clear that the United States and the West generally, if such a concept still exists, is in a state of at best, we could call a deep tension with China. And the Chinese-speaking world itself is also at a, in a state of fairly deep tension with itself, if you think of Hong Kong and Taiwan. And I think that without knowing something of the Chinese language, it is almost impossible to understand some of the things that are going on, because the Chinese language is such a vital part of the culture. If you want to understand Xi Jinping, you really have to read his speeches. And if you don't have any idea of the sort of resonances of some of the things he says, you just won't get it. And I'm not saying everybody has to become like a fluent Chinese speaker who understands classical Chinese. Very far from it. I'm one of these feral Chinese learners. You know, my Chinese is, is very patchy. I, I'm really good at reading news reports and Chinese social media. But, you know, certain other kinds of Chinese can completely throw me off. So I, I, I'm not saying everybody has to be a master of all things Chinese. But I think having some basic fluency and some basic literacy in Chinese puts you in a much better position to understand why China reacts the way it does to certain things, why Joshua Wong reacts the way he does to certain things, why... Tsai Ing-wen reacts the way she does to certain things. And I think these things are of fundamental importance to anybody who cares about the world. So what kind of career opportunities do you see opening up to people who are learning or can speak Chinese? Well, I guess if we're talking about Americans, current U.S. hostilities to China, probably lots of espionage and, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> Department of Defense. <laughs> but, yeah. you know... I, even if we go to war with China, we are still going to be buying pharmaceutical ingredients from them, probably. So the increased tensions with China mean that there will be think tank and academic money devoted towards this. But I think that fundamentally, if you want to understand the world in the coming decades, you have to have a basic literacy in Chinese language and culture. There's no question that China is going to play a huge role on the global stage in the future. It's too big and too rich. Well, Jeremy, I, I need to know about your Chinese name. <laughs> well, my Chinese name is Jin Yumi. So it's Huang Jin de Jin, you know, gold, and Yumi, uh -huh. which is corn. And the characters yeah. for corn obviously mean jade rice, which is quite pretty. <laughs> so it sounds a little bit like Jeremy, and it means literally gold corn, which is my surname. And uh, <laughs> it's my second Chinese uh, name. My first name was suggested to me by a, a former colleague, and it was Guo Jieming. And at some point, uh, a friend of mine said to me, you know, that's really lame. You sound like, you know, some lame high school teacher from <laughs> a province that that friend was prejudiced against, I think. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> not that that happens in China. <laughs> no, oh, no, never. <laughs> no such thing. <laughs> and then this friend suggested Jin Yumi. So I changed my name. And it was great because suddenly every Chinese person could remember it. And 
It was, in fact, my legal name in China. It was on all my documents. Some of them didn't even have my English name on it. So <laughs> right, I think it's good for listeners to know that, like, you know, work permits, you have to have a Chinese name for a work permit. <laughs> yeah, like yeah things, right? I think you still do, right? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. I, I have my Chinese name on it. It's There it is. So you might as well pick a fun one. <laughs> might as well pick one. So Jeremy Goldcorn, Jin Yumi. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeremy, I thank so much for sharing your experiences and, and your time with us. You've had a, a really extensive career in China, and it certainly isn't over. No, no. <laughs> China will never let me go. Just when I thought I was out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always say for some people, you can leave China, but China never leaves you. Yeah, that's that's pretty much right. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, kiddie pool waiter, co-pilot, whitewater rafter, sandcastle builder, sunrise watcher, nap taker, and that one gal named Bonnie. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mannercompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena. We just ran out of time. You Can Learn Chinese Podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is James Harper. I'd like to thank our guest, Jeremy Goldcorn, And of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Paz. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>